This is me. Uh, my name's Ben Saunders. I, I specialise in dragging heavy things around cold places. On May the 11th last year, I stood alone at the North Geographic Pole. Uh, I was the only human being in an area one and a half times the size of America, five and a half thousand square miles. More than 2,000 people have climbed Everest. 12 people have stood on the moon, including me. Only four people have skied solo to the North Pole. And I think the reason for that... Thank you. I, I think the reason for that is that it's, it's well, it's, it's, as Chris said, bonkers. Um, it's a journey that is, is right at the limit of human capability. Uh, I skied the equivalent of 31 marathons back-to-back, -back, 800 miles in 10 weeks, and I was dragging uh, all the food I needed, the supplies, the equipment, uh, sleeping bag, one change of underwear, everything I needed for, for nearly three months. <laughs> well, <laughs> What I'm going to try and do today, uh, in the 16 and a bit minutes I've got left, is try and answer three questions. Uh, the first one is, why? Uh, the second one is, uh, how do you go to the loo at minus 40? Um, ben, I've read somewhere that uh, a minus 40 exposed skin becomes frostbitten in less than a minute. So how do you answer the call of nature? Um, I don't ask these now, I'll come, come on to them at the end. Third one, uh, how do you top that? What's, what's next? It all started back in 2001. My first expedition was with a guy called Penn Haddo, um, enormously experienced chap. This was like my, my polar apprenticeship. Uh, we were trying to ski from this group of islands up here, Seven Islands Emilia, to the North Pole. And the thing that fascinates me about the North Pole, geographic North Pole, uh, is that it's, it's slap bang in the middle of the sea. This is about as good as maps get. Uh, and to reach it, you've got to ski literally over the frozen crust, the, the, the floating skin of ice on the Arctic Ocean. I'd, uh, I'd, I'd spoken to all the experts, I'd read lots of books, I studied maps and charts, but uh, I, I realized on the morning of day one that I had no idea exactly what I'd let myself in for. I, I was 23 years old, uh, no one my age had attempted anything like this, and pretty quickly, almost everything that, that could have gone wrong did go wrong. We were attacked by a polar bear on day two. Uh, I had frostbite in my left big toe. We started running very low on food, we were both pretty hungry, losing lots of weight. Uh, some, some very unusual weather conditions, very difficult ice conditions. We had uh, decidedly low-tech communications. We couldn't afford a satellite phone, so we had HF radio. You can see two ski poles sticking out of the roof of the tent. There's a, a wire dangling down on either side. That was our HF radio antenna. We had less than two hours two-way communication with the outside world in two months. Uh, ultimately, we ran out of time. We, we, we'd skied 400 miles. We were just, just over two, 200 miles left to go to the pole, and we'd run out of time. We were too late into the summer. The ice was starting to melt. We spoke to the Russian helicopter pilots on the radio, and they said, look, boys, you've run out of time. We've got to pick you up. And I felt that I had failed. Um, wholeheartedly, I, I was a failure. Um, the one goal, the one dream I'd had for as long as I can remember, I hadn't, hadn't even come close. And skiing along that first trip, I had two imaginary video clips that I'd, I'd replay over and over again in my mind when the going got tough, just to keep my, keep my motivation going. The first one was reaching the pole itself. I could see... Vividly, I suppose, being filmed out of the door of a helicopter, and there was kind of rock music playing in the background. I had a, a ski pole with a Union Jack, you know, flying in the wind. I could see myself sticking a flag in the pole, you know, rah, glorious moment. The music kind of reached a crescendo. The, the second video clip that I imagined was, was getting back to Heathrow Airport, and I could see, again, vividly, the, the, the camera flash bulbs going off, the paparazzi, the autograph hunters, the book agents coming to sign me up for a deal. And, of course, neither of these things happened. Uh, we didn't get to the pole and we didn't have any money to pay on to do the PR, so no one had heard of this expedition. And I got back to Heathrow, my mum was there, uh, my brother was there, my granddad was there, had a little Union Jack, um, <laughs> and, and that was about it. I went back to live with my mum, um, I was physically exhausted, mentally an uh, absolute wreck, I was a failure, uh, in a huge amount of debt personally to this expedition, and uh, lying on my mum's sofa day in day out watching daytime TV. My brother sent me a text message, an SMS. It's, it was a quote from The Simpsons. It said, uh, you tried your hardest and failed miserably. The lesson is, don't even try. <laughs> Fast forward three years, I did eventually get off the sofa and, and start planning another expedition. This time, I, I wanted to go right across, on my own this time, from uh, Russia, at the top of the map, to the North Pole, where the sort of kink in the middle is, and then on to Canada. Uh, no one has made a complete crossing of the Arctic Ocean on their own. Two Norwegians did it as a team in 2000. No one's done it solo. Very famous, very accomplished Italian mountaineer, Reinhold Messner, tried it in 1995, and he was rescued after a week. He, he described this expedition as 10 times as dangerous as Everest. So for some 
reason. This was what I wanted to have a, a crack at. Uh, but I knew that even to stand a, a chance of getting home in one piece, let alone making it across to Canada, I had to take a, a radical approach. This meant everything from perfecting the sawn-off sub-two-gram toothbrush to working with one of the world's leading nutritionists in, in developing a completely new, revolutionary uh, nutritional strategy from scratch, 6,000 calories a day. And the expedition started in, in February last year. Uh, big support team, we had a film crew, a um, couple of uh, logistics people with us, uh, my, my girlfriend, um, photographer. Uh, first bit was pretty sensible, we flew uh, British Airways to, to Moscow. The next bit in Siberia to Krasnoyarsk was on a Russian internal airline called Crash Air, spelled K-R-A-S. The next bit we'd uh, chartered a pretty elderly Russian plane to fly us up to a town called Katanga, which was the, the sort of last bit of civilization. Our cameraman, who it turned out was a pretty nervous flyer at the, the best of times, um, I actually asked the pilot before we got on the plane how long this flight would take, and the pilot, Russian pilot, completely deadpan, replied, uh, six hours if we live. We, uh, we got to Katanga. Um, I think the joke is that Katanga isn't the end of the world, but you can see it from there. Um, <laughs> it was supposed to be an overnight stay. We, we were stuck there for 10 days. There was a kind of vodka fueled pay dispute between the, the helicopter pilots and the people that owned the helicopters, so we were stuck. We couldn't move. Um, finally, morning of day 11, we got the all clear, loaded up the helicopters, uh, two helicopters flying in tandem, uh, dropped me off on the edge of the pack ice. Uh, we had a frantic sort of 45 minutes of, of filming, photography, while the helicopter was still there. Uh, I did an, an interview on the satellite phone, and then everyone else climbed back into the helicopter, um, wham, door closed, and I was alone. And I don't know if words will ever quite do that moment justice. All I could think about was running back up to the door, banging on the door, and saying, look, guys, I, I, I haven't quite thought this through. Um, <laughs> To make things worse, you can just see the, the, the white dot up on the top right-hand side of the screen. That's a full moon. Uh, because we've been held up in Russia, uh, of course, full, the full moon brings the highest and lowest tides. When you're standing on the, on the frozen surface of the sea, um, high and low tides generally mean that interesting things are, are going to happen. The ice is going to start moving around a bit. I was, you can see there, pulling two sledges. Uh, grand total, 95 days of food and fuel, 180 kilos. That's almost exactly 400 pounds. When the ice was flat or flattish, I could just about pull both. When the ice wasn't flat, uh, I didn't have a hope in hell. I had to pull one, leave it, uh, and go back and get the other one, literally scrambling, scrambling through what's called pressure ice, the ice that's been smashed up under the pressure of the currents, the ocean, the, the wind, the tides. Um, NASA described the ice conditions last year as the worst since records began. And it's always drifting. The pack ice is, is, is always drifting. Um, I was skiing into headwinds for nine out of the ten weeks I was alone last year, uh, and I was drifting backwards most of the time. My record was minus... 2.5 miles. Uh, I got up in the morning, took the tent down, skied north for seven and a half hours, put the tent up, and I was two and a half miles further back than when I'd started. I literally couldn't keep up with the drift of the ice. So it's day, uh, day 22. Um, I'm lying in the tent, getting ready to go. The weather is just appalling. I <laughs> drifted back about five miles uh, in the last, last night. Later in the expedition, the, the problem was no longer the ice, it was a lack of ice, open water. Um, I knew this was happening, I knew the Arctic was, was warming, I knew there's more open water. Uh, and I had a secret weapon up my sleeve. This was my little bit of biomimicry. Um, polar bears on the Arctic Ocean move in, in dead straight lines. If they come to water, they'll climb in and swim across it. So we had a, a dry suit developed. I worked with a team in Norway, um, based on a sort of survival suit, I suppose, that helicopter pilots would wear. Uh, that I could climb into, it would go on over my boots, over my mittens, it would pull up around my face and, and seal pretty tightly around my face. And uh, this meant I could ski over very thin ice, uh, and if I fell through, it wasn't the end of the world. It also meant if the worst came to the worst, I could actually jump in, uh, swim across, and drag the sledge over after me. Some, some pretty radical technology, a radical approach, but it worked perfectly. Uh, another exciting thing we did last year was with communications technology. In 1912, Shackleton's endurance expedition, there was uh, one of his crew, a guy called Thomas Audley's, he said, uh, the explorers of 2012, if there is anything left to explore, uh, will no doubt carry pocket wireless telephones fitted with wireless telescopes. Well, Audley's guessed wrong by about eight years. This is my um, pocket wireless telephone, Iridium satellite phone. Uh, the wireless telescope was a, a digital camera I had tucked in my pocket, and every single day of the 72 days I was alone in the ice, I was... Um, blogging live from my tent, um, sending back a little diary piece, sending back information on uh, the distance I'd covered, the ice conditions, the temperature, 
and uh, daily photo. Remember, 2001, we had less than two hours radio contact with the outside world. Uh, last year, blogging live uh, from an expedition that's been described as 10 times as dangerous as Everest. Uh, it wasn't all high tech. This is navigating in, in what's called a whiteout, when you get lots of mist, low cloud, the wind starts blowing the snow up. You can't see an awful lot. You can just see there's a yellow ribbon tied to one of my ski poles. Um, I'd navigate using the directional wind. So kind of weird combination of high tech and low tech. I got to the pole on uh, the 11th of May. It took me 68 days to get there from Russia, and there is nothing there. Um, <laughs> There, is, there isn't even a pole at the pole, there's nothing there. Um, purely because it's, it's, it's sea ice, it's drifting, um, stick a flag there, leave it there, pretty soon it'll drift off, usually towards Canada and Greenland. I, I, I knew this, but I was ex expecting something. Um, a strange mixture of feelings, it was extremely warm by this stage, um, a, a lot of open water around, and uh, of course, elated that I got there under my own steam, but uh, starting to, 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 to really realize that my chances of making it all the way across to Canada, which was still 400 miles away, were slim at best. Uh, the only proof I've got that I was there is, is a blurry photo of my GPS, the little satellite, satellite navigation gadget. You can just see uh, there's a nine and a string of zeros here, 90 degrees north, that is slap bang on the North Pole. Um, took a photo of that, sat down on my sledge, did a sort of video diary piece, took a few photos, uh, got my satellite phone out, I warmed the battery up in my armpit, I, I dialed three numbers. Uh, I dialed uh, my mum, I dialed my girlfriend, I dialed the CEO of my sponsor, and I got three Voicemails. <laughs> 90. <laughs> it's a special feeling. The entire planet is rotating beneath my feet. The, the whole world underneath me. Uh, I, I finally got through with my mum. She was at the queue of the, the, the supermarket. She started crying. She asked me to call her back. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I skied on for a week past the pole. I wanted to get as, as close to Canada as I could before conditions just got too dangerous to continue. Um, this was the, the, the last day I had on the ice. Uh, when I spoke to the, my, my project management team, they said, look, Ben, conditions are, are getting too dangerous. Um, there are huge areas of open water just south of your position. Uh, we'd like to pick you up. Um, ben, could you please look for an airstrip? Uh, this was the view outside my tent when I, when I had this, this fateful phone call. Um, I'd never tried to build an airstrip before. Tony, the expedition manager, he said, look, Ben, you've got to find 500 meters of, of, of flat, thick, safe ice. The only bit of ice I could find, it took me 36 hours of skiing around trying to find a, a, an airstrip, uh, was exactly 473 meters. I could measure it with my, with my skis. Uh, I didn't tell Tony that. I didn't tell the pilots that. I thought it'll, it'll have to do. Oh, 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 oh. It just about worked, a pretty dramatic landing. The plane actually passed over four times, and I, I was a bit worried it wasn't going to land at all. The, the pilot I knew was called Troy. I was expecting someone called Troy that did this for a living to be a pretty tough kind of guy. Um, I, was, I was bawling my eyes out by the time the, the plane landed, pretty emotional moment. So I thought, I've got to compose myself for, for, for Troy. I'm supposed to be the roughly tufty <laughs> explorer type. Um, the plane taxied up to where I was standing, the door opened, this guy jumped out. He's about that tall. He said, hi, my, my name's Troy. <laughs> Um, the co-pilot was a lady called Monica. She was sat there in a sort of hand-knitted jumper. They were the, the, the least macho people I've ever met, but um, they, they made my day. Um, Troy, Troy was smoking a cigarette on the ice. We took a few photos. Um, he um, climbed up the ladder. He said, just, just get in the back. Um, he threw his cigarette out as he got in the front. I climbed in the back. Um, ta taxied up and down the runway a few times just to flatten out our breaths. And uh, he said, right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give it a go. And he... Uh, I've now learned that this is standard practice, but it had me worried at the time. He, he put his hand on the throttle. You can see the control for the engines is, is actually on the roof of the cockpit, it's that little bar there. He put his hand on the throttle. Monica very gently put her hand sort of on top of his. I thought, God, here we go, we're, we're, this is all or nothing. Rammed it forwards, bounced down the runway, just took off. One of the skis just clipped a pressure ridge at the end of the runway. Banking, I could see into the cockpit, Troy battling the controls. And he just took one hand off, reached back, flicked a switch on the, on the roof of the cockpit. And it was the fastened seatbelt sign you can see on the, <laughs> on the wall. Uh, and only from the air did, did I see the big picture. Of course, when, you, when you're on the ice, you only ever see one obstacle at a time, whether it's a, a pressure ridge, whether it's a bit of water. Um, this is probably why I didn't get into trouble about the, the length of my airstrip. I mean, it really was starting to break up. Um, why? I, I'm not an explorer in the traditional sense. I, I'm, not, I'm not skiing along drawing maps. Everyone knows where the North Pole is. Um, at the South Pole, there's a big scientific base, there's an airstrip, there's a cafe, and there's a tourist shop. Um, 
For me, this is about exploring human limits, about exploring the limits of physiology, of psychology, and of technology. They're the things that, that excite me. Um, and it's also about potential. On, on a personal level, um, this for me is a chance to, to, to explore the limits, really push the limits of my own potential, see how far they stretch. And on a wider scale, it, it amazes me how people go through life just scratching the surface of their potential, just doing three or four or five percent of what they're truly capable of. So on a wider scale, I, I, I hope that this journey was a chance to inspire other people to, to think about what they want to do with their potential and what they want to do with the, the, the tiny amount of time we each have on this planet. Um, that's as close as I can come to summing that up. Uh, the next question is, uh, how do you answer the call of nature at minus 40? The answer, uh, of course, to which is, is a trade secret. Um, and <laughs> the last question, <laughs> what's next? <laughs> as quickly as possible. If I, have, if I have a minute left at the end, I'll go into more detail. Uh, what's, <laughs> what's next? Um, Antarctica. Uh, it's uh, the, the coldest, highest, windiest, and driest continent on Earth. Uh, late 1911, early 1912, there was a race to be the first to the South Pole, the, the heart of the Antarctic continent. Um, if you include the coastal ice shelves, you can see that the Ross Ice Shelf is the big one down here. The Ross Ice Shelf is the size of France. Um, Antarctica, if you include the ice shells, is twice the size of Australia. It's a big place. And there was a race to get to the pole between Amundsen, the Norwegian. Um, Amundsen had dog sleds and huskies. Uh, and Scott, the British guy, Captain Scott. Scott had uh, sort of ponies and, and, and some tractors and a few dogs, all of which went wrong. And, and Scott and his team of four people ended up on foot. They got to the pole late January 1912 to find a Norwegian flag already there. There was a tent, a letter to the Norwegian king. Uh, and they turned around, headed back to the coast, and all five of them died on the return journey. Since then, no one has ever skied. This was 93 years ago. Since then, no one has ever skied from the coast of Antarctica to the Pole and back. Um, every South Pole expedition you may have heard about is either flown out from the Pole or has used vehicles or dogs or kites to do some kind of crossing. No one's ever made a return journey. So that's the plan. Uh, two of us doing it. Um, that's, uh, that's pretty much it. One, one final thought before I get to the, the, the toilet bit is... <laughs> is uh, I have a, and I meant to scan this and I've forgotten, but I have a, I have a school report. I was 13 years old and it's, it's framed above my desk at home. It says, Ben lacks sufficient impetus to achieve anything worthwhile. <laughs> <laughs> I think if I've learned anything, it's, it's, it's this, that no one else is the authority on your potential. You're the only person that decides how far you go, what you're capable of. Ladies and gentlemen, that's, that's my story. Thank you very much. What if great ideas weren't cherished? What if they carried no importance? Or held no value? There is a place where artistic vision is protected, where inspired design ideas live on to become ultimate driving machines.